everyone, and welcome to the Heritage um, Lunchtime Chat Google Hangout. Um, today we are here, I'm Erica Anderson from the Heritage Foundation, and today we're here with Andrew Biggs, a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Thanks for joining us. Hey, good morning. Good, and we've got Jason Richwine from um, Heritage, a senior policy analyst from Heritage. Thanks for joining us, Jason. Thank you. I hope everyone can see the beautiful decorations in my office behind me. <laughs> Yeah, mine too. I mean, it's a great view. Yeah. Um, I would open the blinds, but uh, the sun seeps in and you can't see anything. Um, all right, so today we're talking about uh, the truth about federal salary numbers. Um, that's that's an op-ed that the two of you wrote um, for the Washington Post recently, um, which I noticed got like thousands of comments. Um, so it's obviously a topic that people are very interested in, very opinionated about. Um, so, you know, let's just dig right in. I got a couple of questions from the internet and we just kind of want to get your thoughts on this, uh, on this weighty topic. So, um, the, uh, let's see, right, let me find the first one here. Uh, let's see. First question is, why should Americans care about the salaries and benefits of federal workers to begin with? Well, I think if you if you add up the wages and benefits for federal workers you, each year, you get something like two hundred and seventy billion dollars. So it's not uh, it's not a trivial amount of money. If if you were to adjust that, uh, you know, ten percent, you know, one way or the other, you're talking about some significant budgetary impact. So, you know, we want to get this right. We want to get federal employee compensation to be at fair market levels because that's I think what's fair to everyone, fair to federal employees and to taxpayers. The problem is, and what we're tr trying to, to sort of point out in, in our piece in the Post, is that we don't know uh, where federal workers stand based on the, the way the government does the pay comparison. So we need to improve that to figure out where they are so we can know uh, how far we have to go to get them to the right level. I and think Jason's exactly right. Uh, okay. you know, if, the, if these were small pay differences, about small amounts of money, it, it, we wouldn't bother doing this. But what we've looked at is some pretty large uh, pay gaps between uh, federal workers and private sector workers, and, it, and it's enormous amounts of money. So it really is something worth getting into. And and one of the things that you talk about in this op-ed um, is there are a lot of things that people don't realize when they hear the figures. Um, what are some of the biggest misconceptions about federal pay versus private sector pay? Well, the, the Federal Salary Council, which is a group mostly of union representatives and then uh, a number of outside compensation experts, by law they're required to do a comparison of how much federal workers are being paid versus how much private sector workers get for, for doing the same jobs, the same type of work. What most people don't know is the Federal Salary Council claims that federal employees are on average underpaid by 35% versus private sector workers, which means they get paid 65 cents on the dollar. In our uh, piece in the Washington Post, we run through some technical reasons why that's not, not true, but uh, you know, we, we, you know, it's worth starting out. So just you know, on its face, if the federal government actually paid 65 cents on the dollar, it would be very, very hard for them to attract employees. As it is, not only do they have no trouble attracting employees, they have a turnover rate, a quit rate that's less than half that of big private sector companies. So there's really a mismatch between what this Federal Salary Council is claiming of this 35% pay gap and what you see in the real world. All right, and we do have a question from a reader. Um, this one's a little bit long, so I'm just going to read it. Um, he says, we know that the federal government has to compete with private sector employers and state and local governments to attract and retain workers with the uh, skills and experience it needs. How much more does an individual working for the federal government that holds a doctorate make compared to someone in the private sector that holds a doctorate? How, how, does, how does it compare at the higher levels? In other well, words. Well, typically with, with wages, what you find is that the federal premium uh, for federal workers is highest among the lowest skilled workers, and it's lowest among the highest skilled workers. So in terms of wages, you're not going to be getting a wage premium uh, if you're working for the federal government and you have a PhD. In terms of benefits, it's harder to say. The benefits are still going to be better in almost all cases than what you'd get in the private sector. So how that all weighs up, it's not clear. Uh, the CBO has its own numbers on this. We have ours. Uh, the average, of course, uh, for all the outside studies indicates that federal workers are overcompensated. 
uh, how that breaks down by actual skill level, that there's a little bit more disagreement there. I think in our own study, we found that, that even people with PhDs are going to have a compensation premium, although I believe the CBO, uh, having not taken all the benefits that we did into account, I, I think they do find them to be undercompensated, if I remember correctly. One interesting thing is that Jason and I often get emails from federal employees and they'll say, well, you may claim federal workers are overpaid, but I know that if I went down in the private sector, I could make more money. And, you know, maybe they could, maybe they couldn't. But the interesting thing is these emails are almost always from people who are doctors, engineers, PhDs, the people who it, it's possible they could make a little bit more outside of government. You almost never get these emails from people who are middle or low level federal employees. I think they realize they're getting a pretty good deal. And can you guys talk about some of the the major benefits that you know that federal workers are getting that you know that isn't talked about so much? Well, the the, the, the couple of big ones are the defined benefit portion of their retirement benefits. The the workers under FERS, I think that that began somewhere in the, the mid 1980s, have basically a defined benefit portion of their retirement benefits and a defined contribution. So a defined benefit essentially is like a traditional pension where you get a fixed amount of money at retirement. And then the defined contribution portion is like a 401k. So you get both of those things, which, which is nice. And then, of course, there's also retiree health coverage. A lot of people wonder how is it that the public sector workers can often retire in their 50s. One way they can do that is that they get subsidized health care even after they retire, and they can use that until they become eligible for, for Medicare. Uh, so that's, that's a, uh, some of the major benefits that federal workers receive that are really increasingly rare in the private sector. Okay, and one one uh, point that a commenter on Washington Post brought up was about government contractors and how much those are costing. Did that come into play, or discussion of the, con the how much contractors get paid come into play when you guys were doing research on this? No, the comparison strictly for actual federal employees, not contractors. It would not surprise me at all, of course, that federal contractors also are being paid too much. So this is not something that uh, would be surprising <laughs> given how the federal government may or may not uh, actually, you know, assign the contracts in an optimal way. But th that's that's a separate issue from uh, federal employees themselves. Okay. Uh, next question is. Um, why does the government study vary so drastically from the five other studies that have been done on federal pay? That's a really good question. Um, in, in our op-ed, we pointed out that the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, uh, recently did a study where they reviewed uh, a range of different analyses of federal pay, including one that Jason and I uh, did a year or so ago. And all of the other studies show that federal workers get salaries and benefits at least equal to private sector workers, and in most cases, more. It's uh, really only the Federal Salary Council that's this official number which claims that federal workers are so underpaid. There's a couple of reasons for it. One is the, the Federal Salary Council numbers don't take into account benefits. And as Jason just pointed out, the benefits for federal workers are really very, very generous. Another reason is that the, these uh, federal numbers don't take into account the different skills of workers. The, the, the analyses that we and others have done take into account differences in education and experience between workers. You could have two workers in the exact same job. If one of them has more education and experience, he's likely to be better at that job, and so he's likely to deserve higher pay. What we showed is that when you account for these differences in education and experience, the supposed pay gap for federal employees simply goes away. So it's we're including more information. By having more information and data in there, you can get a better analysis and a better picture of things. The, the, the Federal Salary Council's numbers, the, these official federal numbers, are simply incomplete. They don't take account of enough data. Let me just add, too, that it's really especially unfortunate that their comparisons are, are not up to, to, to standard because they have a lot of data and they have a lot of resources that we don't have. They could do the best pay comparison that anyone has, has done if they really uh, used a methodology that would be endorsed by most labor economists. So getting that right, I think, is really the first step to getting pay right in general for federal workers. All right. And... So reading through the uh, Washington Post uh, comments and just generally when you um, are, are writing and speaking about these things, a lot of people criticize, hey, you guys are from Heritage and AEI, you're pushing a certain narrative. How do you respond to criticism like that, trying to delegitimize what you're saying? 
Well, my first response is to wonder where all this Coke money is. I, where do I get it? Andrew, <laughs> did, you, did you get any yet? I want my share. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, look, I mean, it, it's. I think it's sort of an unfortunate reaction. I, I mean, I, I would hope that people would be a little bit more open-minded than that. I think it's possible to have a political view uh, and still be responsible with numbers. Uh, I think everyone has political views. And, uh, you know, it doesn't really affect the actual empirical work that we've done or the analysis we've done. Maybe it motivates, you know, what topics we choose to work on. But uh, I would like to think that people could look at our work and say, you know, that's something that's very responsible and data-driven because that's what it is. The irony is that these accusations often come from people who are federal workers themselves, who obviously have a vested financial interest in, in, the, in the way things are set up. What we've tried to do is give as much detail as possible in, in the work we've had. And if people make legitimate criticisms, we revise our methodology. We try to bring in new data sources. So we're really putting it all out there because we're not afraid to have people analyze and, and assess the work we've done. So we're not simply making an accusation that federal workers are overpaid. You know, particularly in the Washington Post piece, we try to walk through the methodology of how they figure out these pay comparisons, and we show ways in which it clearly falls short. So we're really happy to have a very you know, kind of data-driven, analytical discussion about this. We're not about throwing bombs and, and simply making accusations that we can't back up. And now, what do you think? I mean, you know, maybe there's a reason you know that they they don't the government uh, study doesn't want to believe that. Uh, that they're wrong. Um, why wouldn't they want to um, to get things right, save money, and um, and do, do things the right way? What would be their reasoning? I'll let Andrew handle that one. <laughs> well, you you, you want to think about the composition of the Federal Salary Council, which which does this analysis. It has nine members. Six of the nine are representatives of federal employee labor unions. The other three are, are outside pay experts that are appointed by the president who happens to be politically aligned with, with mm -hmm. public sector employees. So, look, union representatives have a legal obligation to try to get the best pay and benefits for their members. I don't blame them at all for trying to do that. That's, in fact, their job. So, but, but to expect that they're going to have an entirely dispassionate view about how you analyze these pay figures, I think is just unrealistic. And so what we think is you need to have a, a, a better process for analyzing these things, something which is, is freer from political influence, freer from, from just simply self-interest. So it's, it's not shocking you get the kind of uh, results that you get. It's not shocking that you get some opposition to updating the methodology. Yeah, just to sort of follow up on that, since Andrew took the lead, uh, no, I think he's right that it's difficult to imagine the Federal Salary Council having a study that says federal workers are overpaid. It, it, it's hard to imagine that. But at, this, at the same time, I think this, it's partly just the fact that this is the way they've done it for a long time, and it's hard to change. I think that this basic methodology really started in, I think, 1990, or, or at least that was the law that sort of established how the comparability payments would be made. And that's just the way they've been doing it for a long time. There might be legal constraints against how they uh, can reform things, but you know, regardless of that, uh, you know, it's it's really time to kind of uh, come to the the uh, the present day in terms of how to, how best to do these comparisons. The CBO, for example, and the CBO did one of these these compensation comparisons. You know, they follow the way modern labor economics does this, and I would hope that the Sour Council and the pay agent would would follow their lead. All right, great. A um, couple more questions. Uh, we just got one. Are there studies on the education levels of federal employees versus private sector employees in similar jobs? Uh, yes, that, that's, that's one of the key things we tried to point out in, in the post piece is that if you just compare the average federal worker and the average private worker, federal workers are going to be on average more educated and more experienced. But when you start looking at individual occupations, what you find is that, is that federal workers actually have less education and less experience. And if you don't take that into account, which, which the official comparison does not, then you're going to really end up with skewed comparisons. The example we use a lot is that a senior accountant in the federal government might actually only have the qualifications of a junior accountant in the private sector, but as far as the government pay comparison is concerned, you're just looking at two accountants. So that, that's uh, something that has to be taken into account. They don't do that. 
But as I said, when labor economists approach this kind of thing, the first thing they think about is human capital. You know, what are the skills of the workers who are holding the jobs? And, and that's what the, the government really should be doing as well. Okay, guys, I think this will be the last one. Um, so, you know, after discussing all this, what can be done now to bring federal pay more in line with private sector pay? Well, I don't think you want to use a sort of a, a blunt instrument approach and say, let's just do across the board cuts for, for federal employees. On average, we believe that federal employees receive salaries and benefits that are above private sector levels. But as one of the earlier questions uh, that are referred to, that can differ a lot by the type of job you're in, by the type of background that workers have. So you want to have a much more market-oriented um, approach to federal pay, thinking about supply and demand. You know, if the, if the federal government is, is offering a, a, a job opening and it gets a ton of applicants, that may mean that it's overpaying for the applicants it's getting. On the other hand, if it has a job opening and it can't attract people, it should probably pay more. So you want to bring the market into play because that's how jobs work or how pay works in the private sector every day. All right, guys. Any, any last comments? Anything you want to leave with our viewers before we go? No, I think we're good. Just keep those comments coming in. I, I enjoy every single one of them. Maybe, okay, maybe not every single one. But most <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Jason and Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today on the Heritage Lunchtime Google Hangout. Um, you can join us um, usually on Fridays at noon. We'll be. Uh, this is kind of a special special case because it's Thanksgiving, but you can join us Fridays at noon, and you can um, find uh, you can find our work at heritage.org and um, join us on our Google Plus page for future Google Hangouts. Thanks so much. <laughs>